Hello, welcome. Today, my guest is Dr. Mestre from Nicholas Children's Hospital. He is the chief medical officer, and we're going to have uh, get a lot of information today. So thank you for joining us, doctor. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, like what the services are that are provided at the hospital? Sure. Yeah. So obviously we're a children's hospital. So we see patients uh, typically up to 25, 21 years of age and above. Sometimes we do see older patients uh, if they have a congenital problem that we have to uh, see in the hospital just because many of the adult facilities can't handle it. We have 309 beds uh, within the hospital and we're the largest freestanding children's hospital in the state of Florida. Uh, so we've been proud, we've been here for over 60 years um, in the community and providing services to our children and uh, the pediatric community in general uh, throughout that time. So it's really just an all around, it's a regular hospital, you just focus on young people. Yeah, really, the, right. You <laughs> you offer everything that's available in a, all yeah, the other hospitals. Do everything. Uh, provide all services that's available to uh, children from a medical standpoint. Um, the only things that we don't provide in the hospital are what we call solid organ transplants. Um, at this point, we're not providing those, but uh, we will be hopefully in the in the future. Uh, but in, in regards to solid organ transplants, kidneys, livers, heart transplants, we don't do that as of yet. Uh, but hopefully in the future we will be. Yeah. Now, has the pandemic uh, really affected the hospital this last year? Uh, most definitely. I think uh, all spectrums of healthcare have been affected uh, throughout, um, especially, thankfully, with children, we haven't seen that they are as affected from a clinical standpoint. But as uh, the pandemic started around the South Florida area in, in mid-March, we had to pretty much shut down most of what we call our elective services. Elective services are anything that's not emergent and can be planned. So therefore those um, services such as surgeries, um, maybe removal of tonsils, whatever it might be. Uh, so those more straightforward surgeries had to be um, put off to a later time. So as you can imagine, the volumes that we typically see within the hospital, uh, the emergency department, our urgent care areas uh, decreased significantly, especially in March. Picked up a little bit as the summer went on, but we're nowhere near what we used to be in terms of our capacity to see children throughout uh, South Florida. Uh, as time has gone on, that's slowly improved. Uh, but the good things are many of the children aren't getting other infections, not just COVID, uh, but they, because they're wearing masks, um, and so keeping the social distance. So a lot of, for example, this flu season has been a very, very low flu season, which is great uh, for the health of the children. Uh, so we haven't had to see many of those kids in the hospital. So therefore, uh, we've seen a, a decrease in that type of volume. We do see the children that do have uh, COVID infections, but thankfully, again, that's nowhere near the rate that we see in adults. And thankfully, those children that do have the COVID-19 infection aren't as seriously as affected. They typically handle it very well. And it's usually just kind of a more of a regular cold type symptom. We do see children that get that do have, unfortunately do have to get hospitalized. And since the beginning of March, we've seen about 500 children that have required hospitalization. But thankfully, you know, the greater, great percentage of them do well and leave the hospital without any complications. Well, yeah, there's not a lot of information that I can find on the news anywhere about how the virus is affecting children so yeah yeah it's um is it because it's maybe not affecting children as 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 much as it's not as prevalent as it is with adults yeah it's not definitely not as prevalent and in terms of what we see from the the effect uh, on the children so about if you see all the positive cases that you see on the news about 12 to 13 percent of those cases are children and we call children under the age of uh, 21. So that's the kind of spread in terms of, uh, again, there's not just logically, there's not as many children in the world so uh, as there are adults. Mm -hmm. So that's not gonna be as much of those that are infected. Now, the mortality is significantly less uh, in, in terms of children, the mortality that we see are minuscule compared to what we see in adults. So unfortunately, the, the adults have taken the brunt of this infection and we've seen you know, the over 300,000 uh, mortalities that we've seen thus far in the, just in the United States. 
and it's very similar across all countries. Uh, not, it's, not, it's not the United States that the children aren't getting affected, uh, but when we first saw the reports coming out of China, and Italy, and the United Kingdom, they were following, they followed the same patterns that we had. Now, have there been able to be studies published yet to try to understand why children are not being as affected as much? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of uh, theories out there, nothing that's been proven as of yet in terms of why children aren't as, uh, as affected. Uh, there is some theories that there are other types of coronaviruses that children are exposed to, and perhaps those antibodies may have uh, some effect in terms of prote being protectant uh, to those children where other adults might not have, or if they had those antibodies, those antibodies haven't been recent, uh, recently produced and therefore uh, have higher severity. There are other theories in terms of receptors that the children may or may not have that allows the child not to have the severity of the infection um, that, that, that an adult have. And fortunately, most children are healthy, so they also don't have the comorbidities the diabetes, the hypertension, obesity that, uh, that we see in the adult population. So that's also a protective factor. But as of yet, we're still learning every day in terms of how these children can be affected and how it, it does cause them to, to thankfully do well with this type of infection. You know, I, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but there's, I know a number of families that have been, one of the parents has tested positive. They're living in a home that's not, you know, a mansion. They're living in a normal home and sure. the children don't get anything. It just seems like they're not, uh, it's not catchy. And it seems to me that, you know, if, if you're in a home with a general cold, everybody in the house has a cold. But right. for some reason, this terrible contagious disease, I'm not hearing about children with it. Is yeah. It, yeah, and sometimes we don't. We, we, do, we might actually see that where the parent and thankfully uh, folks do are, are quite careful, um, especially if they're in a family, if the children are in a home. It's been amazing to me how well the children comply with the use of masks. Uh, we have a, more of a challenge with the adolescents. Uh, they're more similar to the adults and not perhaps <laughs> wear the mask. Uh, but the, the children, the younger children are great about it. And uh, that's been a real surprise to me. They've just complied and they kind of follow the rules. Uh, but if within a home, yeah, they, you're exactly right. Sometimes we do see that where a parent might have it and the child might not get it, or the child may have it and just be asymptomatic. A lot of times uh, we, the only way to truly identify it is by doing the testing, which is um, various types of testing that you can do. We always recommend the, what we call the PCR testing that just checks for the amount of virus within the nasal passage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's able to do it. But many times the children might have, uh, might be positive for the test, but in reality, just be uh, walking around and having no symptoms at all. Yeah. So yeah, it is, it is interesting. Again, we don't know the, the exact answer why the, why the children are, are seem to be protected from the complications of the coronavirus. Now, as it's my understanding that most hospitals don't let visitors in, I imagine it may be a little different with you, with parents yeah. needing to be with their children. So what kind of rules have you had to put into place so that can yeah, happen? Most definitely. We, we, try to, or we, we try to make the hospital as safe as possible. And I kind of kiddingly say it, but in reality, it's the truth. One of the places where I feel most safe is within our hospital, just because <laughs> of all the measures that we place and, and put in place. Uh, everybody that comes in has to go through a screening process, uh, whether you've been sick over the past uh, uh, 14 days, or if you've been exposed to anybody that has coronavirus. Everybody must wear a mask before coming in. Um, and uh, like you said, obviously we can allow the children just to be there on their own without their parents. So we do allow two parents um, to, to be there at a, at a time with the, with, the, with the individuals. We don't allow large groups uh, as we had in the past to visit individuals, so it's, which is a challenge a little bit, uh, especially in the South Florida with the abuelos and abuelas. <laughs> but it's a yes, they come in a pack, the whole yeah, family. Exactly. <laughs> and everybody's there at one time. Uh, but again, it, it, they, everybody's been great about following the rules. We ask the parents um, to wear a mask um, when we're in a room uh, with the family. So even if they're negative, we, they, we ask them to wear a mask just to protect our, the healthcare workers as well. 
And we do actually test every child that gets admitted to the hospital. It has to stay in the hospital. They get an immediate test, even if they're not there for COVID uh, or COVID-like symptoms, we test all the children as well for an added protective measure for our staff. So again, with all those measures, we've been lucky to not see uh, much, if any, uh, spread within the hospital. We actually have no known reported cases of spread within the hospital. Wow. What ends up happening what, what occurs outside. Uh, so yeah. if somebody is, it goes outside and to wear a mask and they, they come back to visit, then they might have something. But in terms of passing one to the other, there's nothing that we've identified that's a, that's a known case. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, do you have set up for a parent to sleep in the room with the child when they have to stay there yeah. for an extended yeah, time? Even in, our, even in our ICUs, obviously, we understand uh, being a pediatric hospital, how important that is to the family and to the child and for the health of the child. So we always make sure that the parents can stay in the rooms. We have some uh, hospital areas which are larger, um, have uh, nice couches and beds for the families uh, to stay in. And, and uh, that's our norm. As a children's hospital, we, we not only treat the, the patient, but the, but the whole family. Uh, so within that practice, we have always allowed families. Again, we've had to put some restrictions on that because of COVID. Um, but thankfully, we haven't seen as much of an uptick as we as much of the rest of the country is seeing right now. Our busier months were in uh, the summertime in July, we did see a peak. Uh, we haven't quite seen that peak. We've seen a little bit of an uptick most recently after the holidays, but not as uh, we are seeing, unfortunately, across other areas of the country. Yeah, I mean, mostly what we see are terribly exhausted healthcare workers and all the professionals that are but yeah. I guess you haven't been bombarded as much as, um, you know. No, thankfully, as not. what we've done is we, we try to communicate with all the uh, adult hospitals in the area and open ourselves up because we're experts in treating children. So if they have uh, staff or issues that relate to children, we want to make sure that we're able to uh, take on their children so they can do what they do, which is uh, an expertise in adults. In other areas across the country, other children's hospitals have been asked to take on adult patients. Um, we haven't as of yet. What we do is try to take in everybody's pediatric patients so they can focus on their adults. And we've actually created a great relationship with uh, Baptist Health Systems, where since uh, April 1st, we've taken all of their pediatric patients in order to open up their pediatric areas for the care of adult patients. Yeah. Um, and that's been recommended from the Children's Hospital Association, which is a national association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics as well. Well, wow. that's wonderful that you've been able to do that for them. Now yeah, and then when we, when we, you know, in a time of pandemic, obviously there's competing interest uh, with everybody in healthcare um, across the area. But, you know, we've all agreed that this is a time that we all have to pull together and do what's best for the community. And that's uh, the way we've partnered with other institutions in order to assist with that. Now, have any of the manufacturers of any of the vaccines given protocol as far as uh, age ranges of-, of Yeah. So, so right now the, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, which we've, we've uh, received at our hospital, it's for, for ages 16 years of age and above. The Moderna vaccine, which is the other popular vaccine, is 18 years and above. There are other vaccines that are in the pipelines. Uh, those haven't just uh, made, made known their ages as of yet. So right now, those are the only ages that qualify in terms of receiving a vaccine. Um, those ages, as at least in the state of Florida, haven't been prioritized as the ones to receive the vaccine. Again, most of those healthy patients in that age range will be um, not have any complications uh, secondary to the COVID infection, thankfully so. But we are discussing within our system as well to um, go out for those at risk of uh, receive or for having complications, those patients with any chronic illnesses, if they have uh, obesity, type one diabetes, type two diabetes, um, any neurologic problems that puts them at a higher risk for complications. So we're looking into how can we vaccinate those individuals um, and part of the problem right now is, as you've heard in the news, is, is just the supply. Yeah. Uh, we've been asked to prioritize those 65 years of age and older and healthcare personnel, but we would like to move on further to be able to vaccinate those children that may qualify for the vaccine right now. So hopefully with what, as we get more 
supplies and the federal government continues to supply from the, the manufacturers, we hope to be able to supply that those doses to those patients that are at risk. And there's currently vaccine trials going on right now uh, for children in terms of um, seeing if we can give it to the younger children. And again, not so much that it'll prevent or that it'll have complications in younger children, but we still don't know the, the, the role of maybe a little bit older child to be able to spread it within a household as well. So we'd like to kind of control the spread. And for our teachers who have been dealing with this, that'll, that'll also make their comfort level uh, improve in terms of being able to uh, continue to be teaching in the classroom. Now, have the manufacturers come up with a dosage amount? Is it a, an equal amount to an adult yeah. or? So right now, uh, the dosage amount, again, I haven't seen the, they haven't released the vaccine trials in children, but what we give a 16 year old would be the same dose that's given to the 85 year old grandmother. So it's a 0.3 ml dosage of uh, the vaccine that we administer. And we, so for the Pfizer vaccine that's given, um, for the first dose and then the second dose is given 21 days after the, the the first dose for the moderna vaccine the interval is a little bit longer it's 28 days and thankfully from uh, we've administered approximately 4,000 vaccines within our hospital not just to the healthcare workers but also expanding it to our community and we haven't seen any serious complications from it so which has been great yeah now, do you, under normal circumstances, suggest that children get the flu vaccination that we normally get in this country every year? Yeah, yeah, typically we do, um, especially those with any sort of chronic medical conditions that puts them at higher risk. Uh, we've actually, uh, the flu from the infections that we've seen in the past have been, uh, for lack of a better word, worse than what we see with the, with the COVID-19 infection because the kids can get sicker from it, can get worse pneumonias from it. Uh, so we typically do, and we've made that same recommendation this year and even more so, mainly to keep you know, children out of the hospital. Uh, but thankfully, because of all the um, social distancing and the wearing of masks, we haven't really seen any or very few um, influenza infections, which has been great. Uh, but again, every year we do recommend that. Okay, so it's 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 just almost a different form of a, a flu vaccine that we would normally get anyway, kind of correct, thing. Correct. It's 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 some, it acts in a, it's in a different uh, manner that it works uh, than the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine is what we call an inactivated virus. So small particles of the virus that are inactivated, your body makes uh, uh, antibodies towards that. The COVID vaccines, most of the COVID vaccines are what's called, uh, at least the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are what's called messenger RNA viruses. So they take a small portion of the RNA, which is part of the genetic material of the virus and wrap it up in a, um, for lack of a better term, a little fat molecule, send it in um, to your body. And then your body takes that fat molecule, doesn't take it into the DNA, but just the, what's called the RNA of the cell and then shoots out what, what, what we call the antibodies. And because it, it, that, that messenger RNA material is what is uh, the, the, the genetic material for what's called that spike protein, which you hear about all the time on, on the news. Um, so those are the types of uh, things that we, we want to have people understand the differences because uh, we still see a lot of hesitation um, in regards to individuals receiving the vaccine. Right. Now, who's the regulating body that decides when and how much vaccine you all are allowed to get? That's a great question. So right now, it's, it's done at the state level. The, the federal government um, allows the, or distributes a certain amount to each state, and then the states determine where those vaccines go. Um, as we have a change in administration, though, that it'll be interesting for us to see how that changes. Uh, so in terms of who gets what, if it'll be all done at a federal level versus the state level. So again, uh, the supply issues is, is gonna be a concern. Um, and we wanna get, as, as we say, many, as many shots in arms as we can, <laughs> yeah. just to, to vaccinate as many people as we can. But again, a lot of it is also dependent on the supply that we receive. Matt, have you been able to vaccinate most of your staff? Yeah, so we've uh, vaccinated nearly 60% of our staff. Uh, which has been great. Um, they're still, again, even within the medical field, we still see those that are hesitant 
um, uh, to receive the vaccine. And that includes everybody, not just medical personnel, but those that are involved in the environmental services that have to clean the rooms, but they're around the patients as well. Security that's around the patients, those types of employees. So we do see that there is still some hesitancy, especially within our younger um, employees, but because again, part of the rationale is that they're not gonna get as ill. But, but again, we would want to emphasize that we're trying to uh, vaccinate each individual in order to not just protect yourself, but protect others around you in order to, so even if you, you had the infection, you're not passing it on to those individuals around. Now, have you all been able to um, put together a plan yet to uh, vaccinate the children? It, you mean our staff or... In, in regards to our staff or others in the community. Uh, to the children, to the patients. Yeah, so we we have a, a, a plan just one again, so once we can assure the supply that's coming in in regards to all the specialty services that we have in our, in our hospital and uh, gather a list of all the um, patients that, that would qualify, again, those 16 years and above and with some sort of chronic condition and reach out to the families in terms of making sure that we were able to offer it to them. In addition, reaching out to our pediatric community in, in the area um, and letting them know that we can have uh, this capability of offering the vaccine to these patients um, who are our most vulnerable pediatric patients. And again, we've been able to thankfully offer the vaccine, not just to those members on our hospital staff, but also pediatric practices in the area who again, see a lot of these children that may have COVID and they don't have the immediate testing that we do. So we want to protect them as well. And luckily, we've been able to offer that to them as well. Now, do you have a feeling that maybe in the future, you'll be able to be a location of just come in and get a vaccine process? Ideally, yeah. You know, we, we want to continue to be able to support the pediatric health in our community. And, and perhaps and we're doing right now, we're, we're even doing uh, those 65 years of age and over. Um, as they are related to, to our employees. Um, and it's been great. It's been one of the most gratifying feelings. Again, we're usually involved in treating children, uh, but to see the older community that's had difficulty getting into some other areas be able to come to our institution and, and receive a vaccine. And that's been great um, in terms of uh, the gratitude that we see. And again, we're not used to treating uh, older individuals, but, but that's been very gratifying. No, I'm sure. So if a parent's watching this and they're concerned and they would like their child to be vaccinated, is there a process set up yet for that? Yeah. So right now, if, if there is an individual that is um, 16 years of age and older and they do have a chronic medical condition as, as uh, described by the CDC and that puts them at risk, you know, my recommendation would be to reach out to their pediatrician who uh, can then reach out to us in terms of putting them in priority to, for them to come in and be able to get the vaccine. And one of the challenges that's out there right now with the, um, especially with the Pfizer vaccine is the storage that's required for it. Not every facility has the capabilities to store the, the, the Pfizer vaccine because of the fact that it requires this ultra cold refrigeration at minus 80 degrees. Pediatric practices don't have that, unfortunately. The Moderna vaccine, on the other hand, does have that capability to be held in a regular refrigerator. But unfortunately, again, there has been prioritization in terms of getting the vaccine to those older individuals and healthcare professionals. So as time goes on, this will be more common and hopefully we will see that pediatric practices themselves have the capabilities to vaccinate these children. But in the meantime, we're gonna focus on those higher risk uh, patients that have the chronic conditions. So we ask the pediatricians once they get their individuals that they feel that uh, would, would benefit from the vaccine to contact us and we'll be able to set that up for them. So the best route for a parent is to, if they have concern, is to go through their personal- uh, uh, Pediatrician, correct. Pediatrician. And again, we'll be, we'll, we're, we've been in contact with all the pediatricians in the community in terms of being able to hopefully offer this option soon with where those uh, patients that have chronic conditions uh, that put them at risk and are above 16 years of age, that hopefully soon we'll be able to provide that to them. A lot of it depends on the vaccine supply though. Right. Wow, this was, a, <laughs> this was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of, uh, it's been, you know, a tough time for us as, as healthcare workers and, uh, 
again, we're, we we do feel blessed given that the children have done so well. But at the same time, we do uh, understand that it still puts a, a tax on the family to deal with a child that just has COVID-19, the fear that uh, individuals face. And uh, again, we're, we're here for our community in terms of being able to provide that pediatric care and that kind of that gentle touch that families need for, for um, support. No, this is probably wishful thinking, but have you have you been able to maybe come up with some time in the future that you're going to be able to function back and maybe people that have an elective type of surgery or procedure sure. or something that's not, you know, life threatening? Yeah, we, yeah, we've been able to do it. Uh, thankfully, so we've been able to do that uh, from a, a standpoint of getting back to normal function, per se. Uh, but there still are fears in the community. Uh, from our standpoint, we've essentially doing everything that what we did pre-COVID, we're just taking the extra measures in terms of making sure that we don't put anybody at risk. So from a function standpoint, we're functioning just as we did before. We understand that there's still fear in the community in terms of uh, contracting any viruses or coming to the hospital, which is, which, which, is, which is the right thing to do. But at the same time, we just wanna make sure that the, that the community understands that they shouldn't have any fear of coming to the hospital just because of all, all the measures that we've taken. And my hope would be that it, by the summer or early fall, we get back to somewhat normal. <laughs> a lot of that depends on, on how many individuals in the country get vaccinated. And again, we encourage everybody to be vaccinated because that's the only way we, we see ourselves getting out of this. Um, yeah. and, and unfortunately, that's our only out right now. Right. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, one, for so much that you do for our community. I know the hospital is, is a tremendous resource for our community. And thank you so much for taking the time out to do this, you know, and give this information. Not a problem. It's our honor to be able to serve the community and, and uh, my, my pleasure to be on, uh, on the show and, and be able to provide this information. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Have a great day. And if uh, forward this video, you never know who it's going to help. They're, yeah. Everybody's They're nervous and scared. So we have a, you can go to our website and we have a COVID hotline that you can call and any questions that you have, we're happy to answer. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.